Get the whole Young Turks three-hour show by going to the youngturks.com. If you become a member, you get the whole show, plus a very fun post-game show as well. See you then. Well, the Young Turks, we have an exciting show ahead for you guys. We have an exciting week for you, ahead for you guys. Uh, what uh, ever is Barack Obama going to do? And I emphasize the word ever there. Uh, we might begin to find out this week. Let's hope that process finally begins. Obviously, big news today, Senator Evan Bayh. Uh, retiring out of nowhere and in a way that uh, makes me think that he didn't really want to help the Democratic Party out because he didn't give him a lot of time. Uh, we will get to that issue and then Rachel Maddow uh, went after a Republican on Meet the Press and there was a rare truth telling on that program. Uh, that doesn't happen often. So we will cover that for you as well. But we're going to start the program today with a very interesting different segment. Uh, we don't usually have two people on at the same time, but I'm really pleased uh, to do that in this case. Uh, it's two guys that I really respect, Professor uh, Larry Lessig from Harvard Law School and Glenn Greenwald from Salon.com. And they're on somewhat different sides of this issue here, and we're going to have a discussion and see if we can make sense of the Citizens United case. First, I want to th uh, thank you for both for coming on and, uh, and welcome you both. Glad to be here. Great to be here. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, Professor Lessig, let me start with you. Uh, can you... For the purpose of this conversation, um, just quickly summarize for us what the Citizens United case decided. Sure. <clears throat> the question in Citizens United, as the Supreme Court saw it, was whether Congress has the power to limit corporations in their independent political speech. So these are, this is speech independent of a political campaign. It's not a contribution to a campaign. And Congress had regulated that speech within 60 days of an election. Uh, and the question the court had is whether Congress had that power. And the court said that the First Amendment uh, means that Congress has no such power to limit corporate speech. All right. Now, Glenn, let's start with you, because a lot of people on the progressive side, and, and I would count you generally on that side, uh, think that this was a disastrous decision and that it was... Uh, could have disastrous political consequences for our system. Uh, but more to the heart of what we want to talk about here today uh, was also disastrous in terms of whether it was a correct decision or not judicially. Um, largely speaking, you don't seem to agree with that if I've got it right. Why, why do you think the case might have, the court might have gotten it right in this case? Well, first of all, I think the distinction that you draw is really, 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 is really important, which is the distinction between a decision that's disastrous and one that's wrongly decided. Um, it may be the case. I'm not actually convinced um, because the status quo before this case was so heinous in terms of how much influence corporations uh, possessed and, and exerted on the congressional process. But even if it's true that this decision made things marginally worse or substantially worse, that isn't evidence necessarily that the court got it wrong. Sometimes the Constitution protects activities that are very harmful. The, co the Constitution obviously protects the rights of Nazis or other extremists to speak freely, that can have some very damaging effects, and, and yet the Constitution doesn't allow us to ban that speech, even though banning that speech might be beneficial. So I think that the distinction that you drew, first and foremost, has to be underscored, um, because I think that sometimes it gets conflated in, in discussions of, of court cases. But for me, the, it's, it's a fairly simple uh, issue as far as whether the court got it right, which is... I think it's a very hard case um, because, as I said, and I think Professor Lessig certainly agrees, the influence that corporations exert on our political process, the stranglehold that they exert on the legislative process in particular, is, in my view at least, one of the two or three top threats that our democracy faces. Um, on the other hand, the First Amendment is extraordinarily clear and compelling, and it says Congress shall make no law bridging free speech. Um, this bill, this, this law that was invalidated on its face, does exactly that. And of course, what gave rise to this case was a, an activist group, Citizens United, um, that was a group of citizens sharing a certain ideology that wanted to disseminate a film criticizing a presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, and was banned by the government from doing so. So it's really core political speech of exactly the kind of censorship that the First Amendment was designed to prevent. And I think that the solutions that we find to this problem of corporate control need to be something other than empowering the government to decide who can and cannot speak about political issues and, and when they can do that speaking. So, Professor Lessig, let's go to you. You know, 
Glenn makes a compelling case for, hey, this is political speech, and it's exactly what the First Amendment is supposed to protect, whether we like it or we don't like it. Uh, what's the answer to that? Well, I, <clears throat> I think Glenn is right in about 16 different ways. Um, uh, but I think that there's, there's one part that's missing to the story, which kind of explains what the conflict is, at least among people who, like Glenn, um, recognize the extraordinary corruption which is our government today. So what he's right about is this is plainly p political speech. Um, and he's certainly right that the First Amendment traditionally protects this kind of speech as strongly as any speech. But I think that most people, when they hear the issue here, are not actually, th most people who are concerned, are not actually thinking about people like Citizens United. They're not actually even thinking about corporate speech. What they see this case as a proxy for is exactly the problem which I think Glenn has written about so compellingly in a thousand different contexts. Um, they see it as a proxy for uh, a Congress which becomes increasingly dependent upon private interests and not sufficiently dependent upon doing what the people want. Um, so the narrow context in which I think there's a hard constitutional question is not the case as it was presented, whether this you know, silly film by this nonprofit should be allowed. I, I think it plainly should. But whether there's any ability for Congress to insulate itself from influences that lead 90% of Americans to believe money buys results in Congress. Now, in that frame like that, there's a very interesting parallel case, which the Supreme Court decided uh, just last term. This is the case of the Massey case, um, where you know, which is actually literally a John Grisham novel, um, uh, where uh, a court, a, ca a, a company loses, a coal company loses a $50 million judgment. The chairman of the coal company spends $3 million to kick out a judge on the appellate court, and then uh, the judge that gets replacing the judge that was kicked out cast the deciding vote in favor of the coal company. And the question the court had to ask was, did the Constitution require that judge to step aside, to recuse himself? And what the court held was, because the obvious implication of this uh, pattern of uh, facts was to lead people to think that the judge had been improperly influenced, he had a constitutional obligation to step aside in the case. Now, I think what's, what's striking is that there the court is very sensitive to the need to protect the institutional integrity of the courts, but has almost given Congress uh, no easy or obvious way, except the one that I, I, I'm pretty sure Glenn and I agree about, um, to protect the institutional integrity of Congress. Because where Congress is structured, the way it's structured right now, and you know, if in fact it sh turns out that we have billions of dollars spent by corporations in congressional elections to elect the particular Congress they want, it'll only get worse. Then what we have is a Congress people don't trust, people believe money buys the results in, and it further weakens the effectiveness of this democracy. But Professor Blessing, I think we all three of us agree on that, that, you know, that that this is very troubling, or potentially troubling at least. And, uh, you know, not only do I agree with Greg that it's a top three issue, uh, with Glenn I should say that it's a top three issue, I think it's a top issue. And we've talked about that on the show before. But I'm not sure we've gotten to the core of Glenn's uh, issue here as to saying, hey, whether we think it's terribly troubling or not, it's a First Amendment matter. And what are the reasonable limits that you could put on the First Amendment, and does this meet those reasonable limits and, and stand? Well, I, I, again, I'm not somebody who believes that Glenn is wrong to think that political speech like this needs to be protected and is protected by the First Amendment. I think there's, that, in fact, in the complex mix of cases that is the Supreme Court's First Amendment doctrine, it would not have been hard at all to draw a consistent line through a series of cases that would possibly not have found constitutional authority to limit speech in this context, but in the context of corporations spending you know, such a disproportionate and significant amount of money as they did in the Capertown case or the Massey case, um, that there would be constitutional authority uh, to limit it. So in, in the sense of, was there something wrong about finding that this speech was protected? I think the answer is no. But if it means that there's no power of Congress to insulate itself from the kind of influences that lead people to believe that money buys results in Congress, then we have a serious problem about the ability of our democracy to protect itself from this 
cynic, cynicism breeding uh, dynamic that, of course, all three of us agree is at the center of Congress's problem right now. So, Glenn, in my mind, that leads to two other issues. And, and here we're talking to Professor Larry Lessig from Harvard Law School and Glenn Greenwald from Salon and also the author of How Would a Patriot Act, A Tragic Legacy, and Great American Hypocrites. Uh, Glenn, one, uh, everybody knows, obviously, that you, know, you have the right to freedom of speech, but you don't have a right to shout uh, fire in a crowded theater. Uh, can an argument be made that uh, putting this much money into campaigns at any time that they want uh, gets to the point where, in the scope of our national political system, we're shouting fire in a crowded theater? No. Let me, let me, let me tell you why. Shouting fire in a crowded theater is not an expression of a political opinion. It's not core political speech. It's really um, an expression of a false claim, a false factual statement that leads to all sorts of damage. The argument that you're making, which is that the political speech in question produces such grave dangers to our democracy that we ought to be permitted to, uh, Congress ought to be able to be able to restrict it, um, for one thing, doesn't find any support in the text of the First Amendment, which says that Congress shall make no law abridging free speech, not unless there's a really good reason to do so. Um, although, Professor Lessig is right that the court has found reasons to limit free speech, notwithstanding that. But more importantly, if you go back and look at all the instances in which people have tried to restrict political speech, not you know fraud or or, or yelling crowded or fire in a crowded movie theater, but political speech, core political speech, what they always say is that well, this speech in question is so presents such grave danger that we need to pr prohibit it. That's what was said about communists who didn't believe in our form of government and wanted to overthrow it violently and therefore needed to be restricted, or critics of World War I undermining the war effort, or what some people like Newt Gingrich say now about expressions of what they consider to be radical Islam and, and the need to uh, limit it. So I'm very wary of the argument. I think you'd have a hard time convincing me in any case that when you talk about core political speech, that the argument that, well, there's something so gravely damaging about this particular speech justifies its limitation. What I think is the more interesting question, um, and, and, you know, again, I think there's been a lot of exaggeration about the effect of this decision. I mean, both Professor Lessig and I have been writing about how the Congress and our political system is drowning in money long before Citizens United ever happened. Um, I think the uh, extent to which this will change things um, has been overstated. But what I think is the more interesting issue, especially now that this decision is is, is has been issued um, is are there ways to address these problems uh, short of empowering the government to limit and, and restrict political speech and you know professor Lessig has has written about a lot of potential approaches the most promising of which I think um, in the way that Congress can insulate itself from the sorts of perceptions accurate perceptions that the citizenry has that it's not acting free of corruption um, is through a serious public financing system, which will alleviate the need for members of Congress to serve the interests of large corporate donors as a means of getting elected. And I think exploring that, um, as well as potential amendments to the Constitution, which I generally am very averse to, but in this case I think is probably warranted, um, is, is the more fruitful question at this point in terms of how to control this problem that we all agree is, is such a, a menace. And Glenn, let me stay with you go to, to go to point number two, because I, again, I think if you asked all three of us, we'd say campaign finance reform is critical and that might begin to address this issue. But that has not happened yet. And before it does, uh, the case Citizens United might have a dramatic effect before any, uh, anything else does. And so that, that leads to point number two, which is this idea of corporate personhood. Yes, you might have a right as an American citizen to say anything you like, and it might be right before an election, and you might say it to the tune of a billion dollars, that might go for me as well. But why does it go for a corporation that is not a human being, that is not endowed with inalienable rights, and that is really uh, not only a fiction uh, as in terms of a, a political entity, it's something that we've agreed upon, uh, but uh, furthermore, you know, you have the issues of foreign corporations, and... and well, let me save the foreign corporations for the second part, but let's, let's start there. Why, why are they people? Well, first of all, the, I don't think the issue really depends on that question about whether corporate, corporations possess personhood. There's a lot of interest in that question. I don't think the resolution of this case requires, um, or certainly not principally, um, an analysis of that question, because the First Amendment, there are amendments that vest rights in persons. The First Amendment is not one of them. It doesn't talk about persons. It simply says Congress shall make no law bridging 
free speech. Um, so you don't have to be a person to have a First Amendment right. The First Amendment is really about restricting what Congress can do in the way of free speech. But I think more importantly, if you really want to take that position, I don't think, I know that none of the nine justices on the Supreme Court took this position, and I don't think Professor Russick does either, but if you really want to take the position that corporations are not persons and therefore don't possess constitutional rights, what you're really doing is endorsing some fairly radical notions, some dangerous notions. It would mean that Congress could fine corporations $10 million every time they criticize the government or endorsed or, or said anything good about a conservative politician. It would mean that they have no uh, uh, Fourth Amendment rights, which means the FBI could just go and invade corporate offices at will um, and search and seize without probable cause or warrant. Uh, labor unions and advocacy groups like the ACLU also aren't persons. Uh, so if you really think that no one except actual human beings have constitutional rights, it would mean that Congress can bar labor unions or advocacy groups from expressing political opinions or assembling or petitioning the government. So I think you know anyone who wants to take that, that view ought to recognize not only that it's radical, but that it's actually quite dangerous. I think the more reasonable position is the one that Professor West raised in his response to some of the arguments I made, which is, well, corporations have constitutional rights, but because they're creatures of the state, because they get benefits from the state, the state has more of a right to condition, to impose conditions in exchange for giving that benefit. Um, that, I think, is a, more, a much more reasonable argument. Um, to me, though, even that, um, I think, from a constitutional perspective, is, 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 is dangerous, because what it would essentially say is the, the government can't actively bar you from engaging in free speech or exercising your other uh, rights with regard to the Constitution. But what it can do is if it gives you a benefit, it can require, in exchange for that benefit, that you relinquish certain rights. So it could say, if we're going to give you welfare payments or disability or unemployment, you're barred from speaking out against the government. You're barred from making contributions to a political campaign. And under the argument, well, you're not barred if you don't want to accept our benefit, but once you accept our benefit, we have the right to start regulating what it is that you do. So I think even... Even if, even if granting the reasonability of that argument that because corporations are creatures of the state, the state should have more of a power to regulate what they can do. I think there's still clearly constitutional problems and, and also problems from a practical perspective in empowering the government um, under that framework that says once we give you a benefit, we can start telling you what to do. With, and, and, and if you don't like it, you don't have to accept the benefit. Professor Lessig, let's, let's address that because that's an interesting uh, objection that Glenn raises to your point. And, and would you be willing to say, hey, you know, if you are taking a benefit from the government, uh, if you're taking TARP money, whatever it might be, there's a hundred different cases, then we could put limits on what you say uh, during a campaign. Or would you apply that to all corporations because you think in some way they all benefit from the government? And then is, that seems to be an issue, at least, of whether that's too broad. Yeah, well, this is important. It's very important to be precise about what actually is being restricted and what, what is not being restricted. So if the government said, in exchange for you having a driver's license, you've got to give up your right to vote Democratic, that is plainly unconstitutional. Because of what the government is doing is taking away your right, your individual right, something that you were that was endow, you were endowed by your creator with that unalienable right, and you and you can't be forced to give it up. Even understanding that, though, we should recognize, as as I remarked in the in the note that I I, I posted in response to Glenn's um, piece, there have been plenty of cases where the government has effectively done that. Um, so a, fa a famous case, Rust versus Sullivan, where the doctors worked in a family planning clinic that got 5% of its money from the federal government. The, the government said, Ronald Reagan said, you can't discuss abortion as a method fa of family planning with your patients. And the Supreme Court said, no First Amendment problem at all. You don't like it, don't take the money from the government. So the government can effectively buy out your personal rights in, in lots of contexts, and I think in many more contexts than they should be allowed to. Um, but, but I agree, this is, a, this is a very sensitive, important question, and I would certainly be on the side of many fewer contexts in which anybody can buy out or effectively force you to give up your rights. But that's not what's at issue in the corporate speech case. Because in the corporate speech case, the fact that Exxon cannot, would not be allowed to exercise its power to use its treasury money to spend on corporate campaigns 
does not reduce the ability of any particular individual in Exxon to spend his money on corporate campaigns. This is all about the legal entity, not about the individuals. So when, when this is characterized as a case about silencing a particular perspective, there's no si- perspective silenced. It's just particular actors who are creatures of the state. And, and that's what's so weird about this, this kind of Blade Runner moment where we've created these entities and then we've discovered they've been endowed by their creator, us, with these unalienable rights. And, you know, I think the hard question is not whether the Constitution gives us the power to take away rights from individuals. It's why can't we build entities that have a different mix of rights? So th- that, that, the, the problem with this whole argument, though, is that I don't actually want to take away the rights of corporations to speak. I actually think we should have the widest range of uh, speech rights possible. But I think that the, prob- the core problem is the one that we've all agreed on, and th- this is the, em- the point I want to emphasize, is exactly what Glenn said. We've got to get back to thinking about what a real solution to this problem is. And a real solution is not denying corporations personhood, or it's not even denying the Citizens United the right to uh, put out their silly films. The real solution to this is to change the economy of influence in Washington by building a real public or citizen-funded election system. And, you know, right now, this minute, in Congress, there's a bill with 135 co-sponsors that would make an important first step towards that end. And rather than uh, dickering around with these tiny little responses like the administration is supporting and the Democrats in Congress are supporting that will not change this problem at all, progressives ought to be pushing Congress to be adopting citizen-funded elections tomorrow. And that would radically change this problem, even if it doesn't solve it. Because I don't think either of us know exactly how much money Citizens United is going to bring in on one side of the equation. But we at least ought to start in a pro-speech way by supporting regulations, that supporting a regime that gives us much more speech to balance whatever distorting effect corporate speech has. If I could, let me just do one more question for both of you, because I'm... <laughs> genuinely interested in your answers here because Glenn brought up a really uh, good point about hey the government being able to come to a UPS or or a CNN and saying hey you cannot say anything about the Democratic Party anymore or the Republican Party anymore otherwise uh, you know XYZ if they don't have uh, you know freedom of speech rights then couldn't they presumably do that Professor Lessig and if and if you say they can't then isn't Citizens United fairly correct well what I said was there's a line of authority with it that would authorize a kind of regulation like the one in Citizens United. Again, admitting I don't want to block Citizens United from speaking. The question from a constitutional perspective is how could they do it? And the answer is that the, the Constitution, if, you, if people just read beyond the, the freedom of speech clause, already has built in it an explicit protection for the class of speech that I think all of us believe the government you know, should have no ability to touch, which is speech by the press. So if CNN says something, or CNN, or the New York Times, or Slate.com wants to say anything, or the Young Turks, do I think the, the government has any power to try to control anything that they say? No, absolutely not. And I would also say, I don't think the, power, the government has the power even for Exxon to say that you can't utter, you know, political speech about, you know, global warming that denies global warming. I think that's also, there could be no possible justification for that regulation either. But the question is, if government is trying to regulate to avoid this corrupting influence inside of the government, does, should the First Amendment block it? I don't see why it should. But again, I don't think that this is, this is the fruitful way to deal with this problem. I think the way to deal with it is exactly what Glenn said. And, and Glenn, final question for you. Um, you know, if you take Citizens United to its logical extreme, um, it didn't say that only national uh, corporations or United States corporations have uh, rights. So could a corporation run by a Saudi prince or Hugo Chavez or anything like that come in and say, all right, I'm going to spend a billion dollars on the Connecticut campaign or the next presidential campaign? And wouldn't that be a significant issue? Well, you know, this is the interesting issue because uh, Professor Lessig's critique of Citizens United is, is something I absolutely agree with, even though I think the court, the majority, got, got the, the issue right in, in, in many respects, which is that what they really did was they ignored their own precedent in huge numbers of instances. They um, had endorsed these very same justices, all sorts of 
prior restrictions on the First Amendment that were inconsistent with what they did here. Um, and so while the court wrapped it, the judges wrapped themselves in this First Amendment flag, I actually um, am the last person to think that that was authentic or sincere, what they were really doing. Well, I think they, they did doubt the notion that there's real corruption. There was even, I think, a footnote, if I recall correctly, from Justice Kennedy doubting that there was even a single vote that anybody could identify that was actually ever bought, um, when the entire process itself is is bought or sold. So, you know, you're right that if the court were to extend its principles to its logical conclusion, it might threaten prohibitions on foreign corporations from spending money to influence our elections. But that isn't how this court operates through principle. Um, And I think what they would say is that in the case of foreign corporations, um, they possess certainly lesser um, free speech rights than uh, corporations based in the United States or that are American in, 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 in their nature, um, and that the compelling interest is far greater in preventing foreign influence than in preventing American corporations from speaking out about our elections. That wouldn't be principled. I don't think that would be a consistent thing to do, but I think that's something that they would do. And, of course, this case did not directly address those uh, print those prohibitions on, on foreign corporations uh, from speaking. But I think if that case were brought before the court, they would have no difficulty if they were so inclined, purely on an outcome basis, um, from dispensing with the First Amendment principles and saying that that's different. The, compel- the interest is much more compelling. All right. Glenn Greenwald from Salon and the author of Great American Hypocrites and Professor Larry Lessig from Harvard Law School and from Change Congress. Thank you both so much for joining us. It was a great conversation. We really appreciated it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back. Back on the Young Turks. Now, uh, I have one more Dick Cheney clip I want to give you. It has nothing to do with any of those issues that we were discussing, whether it's uh, national security, uh, the stimulus uh, funding that uh, was not related to Dick Cheney but was related to some of the Sunday talk shows and topic of discussion. It has to do with Sarah Palin. Now, Dick Cheney says he disagrees with Sarah Palin here, and in it, I think it's fair to say that he took a shot at her, right? I think the question is, why did he take this shot at her? Let's watch it first, and then I'll tell you why I think he might have done this. Clip number two. I'd like to get your response to Sarah Palin's recent comments on Iran. Say he decided to declare war on Iran or decided to really come out and do whatever he could to um, support Israel, which I would like him to do. If he decided um, to toughen up and do all that he can to secure our nation and our allies, I think people would um, perhaps shift their thinking a little bit and decide, well, maybe he's tougher than we think he's, than he is today. She's, of course, talking about President Obama, seemed to be implying that this would be a, a good political move for him. What's your take? I don't think a uh, president can make a judgment like that uh, on the basis of politics. The stakes are too high, the consequences um, too significant to be um, treating those as, as simple political calculations. When you begin to talk about war, talk about crossing the international borders, you talk about committing uh, American men and women to combat, um, that takes place on a plane clear blo- above any political consideration. So, so I'd, be, uh, I'd be very cautious about uh, treating uh, that kind of issue on uh, those kinds of conditions. We're almost out of time. I want to get you very quickly on a few other subjects. First of all, one more on Palin. Is she qualified to be president? I uh, haven't made a decision yet on who I'm going to support for president uh, next time around. Whoever it is is going to have to prove themselves uh, capable of being president of the United States. And uh, those tests will will come during the course of campaigns, obviously. Um, I think, uh, well, I think all the prospective candidates out there have got a lot of work to do if, in fact, they're going to persuade a majority of Americans that they're ready to take on the world's toughest job. Okay, two very interesting things there. First, the obvious second part of it. Do you think she's qualified to be president? No answer. None. Did not answer that question. He said, a a lot of the candidates have a lot of work to do, uh, and I haven't decided who I'm going to support yet. Well, he didn't ask you that. He just asked you if she's qualified which is the bare minimum, and you couldn't give an easy answer of yes to that? He didn't ask you who who you were going to support. All right, now, I think the more interesting part was the first part, though. Why? 
Because Sarah Palin says about how Obama would be better served if he attacked Iran and supported Israel 100 percent. For, forget the substance of that uh, comment. It's ridiculous. We've talked about it before. But now Cheney could have easily, as a political ally of Sarah Palin, as a fellow Republican, brushed that off as, well, you know, she's hoping that the president does the right thing. Now Cheney once thought that Bush should have attacked Iran and was very mad that he didn't. So obviously he agrees with Sarah Palin. So it's so easy for a politician as he did in the second part, uh, evade the question. Instead of saying, well, you know what, that's political, and I, if I was her, I wouldn't do something political like that, or encourage the president to take foreign policy action based on politics, could have easily turned it around to, well, I think she's right on the substance, and no, I don't think he's, she's encouraging the president to do anything political. In fact, that wasn't even the question. So he almost went out of his way to insinuate that Sarah Palin is telling the president to, to act on national security issues based on politics. So why is he taking that pot shot at her and then wouldn't even say that she's barely qualified? Now this part is conjecture and that, that explanation is, is clear, right? The next part is conjecture. Either he just thinks Sarah Palin is grossly unqualified and has no intention of supporting her even one percent but for a guy like Dick Cheney, I, that has never stopped him before he supported George W. Bush if he thought he could get him to where he wanted. So, but my guess on it is, you know what? Maybe he's considering, not that he's necessarily going to do it, but that he's considering running himself. Because then Sarah Palin would not be his political ally. She would be his political enemy. Because she'd, he'd have to go through her to get the nomination in which case he has all the incentive in the world to badmouth her and to say that she does things based on politics, that she's not necessarily qualified, etc. So the fact that Cheney acted like that triggered an alarm in my head thinking, uh, oh, this guy might be thinking about 2012, which would certainly be interesting. And can you imagine Cheney versus Palin? How vicious that would be. Oh. You know what? I got a little excited thinking about it. All right. Now, now let's go to Evan Bayh. Evan Bayh is the senator from uh, um, Indiana. He's a Democrat, uh, known as a quote-unquote centrist. I, I think his whole career has been structured around how to suck lobbyist money out uh, most effectively. Uh, doesn't really care. Uh, Democrat, Republican policies, not <laughs> you know, progressive or otherwise. Who cares, right? And, you know, we've uh, told you the stories before about how he's surrounded by a phalanx of lobbyists and his wife is on so many different boards, including health insurance company boards. They make, the Bayh family makes millions off of. And then surprisingly, he was in favor of protecting health insurance corporations during health care reform. Who could have seen that coming? So I am no fan of Evan Bayh. Let's be clear about that, okay? Now, the Democrats are in a panic, though, because it's Indiana. That's a swing state. And uh, without an established Democrat like Evan Bayh, especially in this political climate, they're worried to death that they're going to lose that seat, and that's going to go to a Republican. Now, one, I I'm not so sure that's true. I think that there's some chance that a Democrat who is not an incumbent might be in a better position. Now, look, I I'm not naive. Don't get me wrong. At this current point, uh, the, it looks like the Republican nominee is going to be Dan Coats, a former senator from Indiana. He had retired and he's going to, trying to make a comeback. And if, if matched up against Evan Bayh, the current polls apparently had Bayh uh, leading by 20 points. The flip side is Martha Coakley was leading by 20, 30 points before Scott Brown caught up and, and passed her. Now, Dan Coats is not a Scott Brown. Scott Brown is an like empty slate. Nobody knows a thing about him. Uh, Dan Coates is a well-known quantity, and he's been, we want to talk about lobbyists. He's been working uh, for the lobbying industry in general for a long time in Washington. He's buried up to his neck in special interests. In my opinion, the Republicans couldn't have run anybody worse in Indiana. So maybe a non-incumbent winds up helping the Democrats in some ironic way. Now, I wouldn't have banked on that. I'm not saying that that's the direction they should have gone. But given this situation, don't cry too much that Evan Bayh is gone. But my real question is, why did Evan Bayh make this decision so damn late? Because now, in order for anybody to run for that seat, the filing deadline's on Friday. They've got to go to 
every uh, uh, district, congressional district in Indiana, and collect 500 signatures to properly certify a candidacy. They're talking about Brad Ellsworth, who's a blue dog Democrat in the uh, House, trying to take that seat uh, as a senator. That maybe that's the consideration they're having. But it's so damn late that it's not clear that anybody else would have a chance, would have enough organization, would have enough money, would be able to uh, muster up enough uh, ground troops right away to be able to get those signatures. I mean, either Evan Bayh is, you know, wants to help someone like Brad Ellsworth and had already talked to him and had already set this up and did this so late that only he could compete effectively in that race and then they plant Ellsworth's name in there and they go, oh well that's your only choice, right? And remember he's a blue dog Democrat, you know what that usually means, right? That usually means you pretend to be centrist while taking corporate money. Or Evan Bay is so, you know, pissed or indifferent at the Democratic Party that he thought, well let me leave as late as possible so that they have no chance of fielding almost anyone to r effectively run in that seat. Uh, either way, he did not do the Democrats any favors by doing uh, his resignation in the manner that he did that. Surprising that Evan Bayh winds up hurting the Democratic Party again on his way out. Uh, so we'll see if Ellsworth can uh, wind up mustering up the, the forces, etc., to be able to do this by Friday. We'll see if it's him, we'll see if it's somebody else. Now, if we had more time, what I would have loved is a real progressive candidate. Someone who uh, goes up against Dan Coats and goes, look, I'm not in Washington. I, and I didn't sell out to any corporate lobbies. Dan Coates, I can prove it to you. I mean, here's the money he took from this corporation and that corporation and this lobbying group, etc. This guy is as bad as it could possibly be. If you had a real progressive candidate in Indiana, I don't care. Look, see, because the thing is, again, this is all uh, uh, um, uh, the way that the Washington media frames it, that's all wrong, right? Because they say, oh, a progressive candidate can't win in Indiana because Indiana is a fairly conservative state. The voters aren't conservative, uh, w worried about conservative or liberal. Look at Massachusetts. They're worried about, are you a corporate sellout, are you g or are you going to represent the voters' interests? Special interests or voters' interests? They just did a poll on this. And uh, people said that they thought, 80% uh, of the American people thought that their congressmen represented special interests and not the voters. Only 13% thought uh, they represented the voters. That's the real issue. So could a progressive have a chance in Indiana? If he said, I'm going to represent you, and Dan Coates isn't, absolutely, absolutely. It's not a progressive or a conservative issue. But instead, of course, what they will do is probably pick someone who's a blue dog Democrat who has a long history of selling out to corporate America, and then he won't be able to run effectively against Dan Coates because he's just as guilty as Dan Coates is, or not quite as guilty, but almost. And then when they lose the seat, their conclusion will be, damn it, we should have ran further to the right. And all of that brought to you by Evan Bayh. Thanks, Evan. We really appreciate it. And now, the other part of this equation is, why is Evan Bayh retiring? There's a lot of theories on this, and this is a very important question, because now we've had a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans retiring lately, and it makes me think, what do they know that we don't know? Why is everybody running for the hills? Okay, you got Dorgan, you got Dodd and you got Evan Bayh and uh, Senate uh, uh, Democrats that people did not expect to retire. I mean, you have all the resignations of people who, uh, that we knew were going to retire, let alone these three new guys out of the blue. W one, they could be seeing some internal polls that we don't know and think, oh, we're going to get clobbered in 2010. We've got to get out of here before we lose in disgrace. Possible, right? Number two, I wonder if they think something is going to happen with corporate lobbying and it could be one of two things here okay it could be that hey you know what eventually the, the american people are sick of this uh, the lobbyist money is going to run out at some point i better hurry up and retire so i could cash in on that lobbyist money right away before it runs dry okay they're going to pass new laws new regulations with the you know the state of america as it is people are going to get sick of this and if I retire after they do real reform on lobbyists, well, then I won't get paid, and I won't get to make millions of dollars. That's a possibility. That's the more hopeful possibility, believe it or not. The other possibility is they think, oh, decisions like Citizen United and the fact that Obama and the Democrats have not been able to do a damn thing about the lobbyists and haven't really cared to do anything about the lobbyists indicates 
that we're going to, if I go and become a lobbyist, I'm going to make a tremendous amount of money for as far as the eye can see, for as long as you could possibly imagine. So let me go get it while the going, while the going is good. Here's what I do not believe in any way, shape, or form, what they actually say when they retire. <laughs> Evan Bai, of course, says, you know, I still want to serve the American people, but, you know, I'm tired of the partisanship in Congress. La, 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 go, 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 And what, is he, what can he do? He says, well, you know, I might serve in an educational institution, maybe a charity, or maybe serve the American people uh, in policy issues in other ways, uh, working with uh, businesses in America. Really? Hmm. Me, I'm going to go with uh, choice C there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, business interests. Serve the American people. In other words, serve the Bi family pocketbook. So I'm not saying all these guys are retiring for the money. But is that a, certainly a large part of it? Hell yes. I mean, Dorgan, after he retired, and Dorgan's largely one of the good guys, not on energy issues, but on most of the other issues. After he retired, he said, oh, yeah, you know, I might work in the energy sector a little bit. See how that goes. Meaning, here come the money. Here come the money. Gimme, 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 gimme. So, look, the, this goes to my final point here and what we were discussing all of last week. These guys aren't just bought because of the few campaign bucks that they get. They're bought because of the implicit bribe they're going to get later once they retire. So it looks like a lot of these senators and a lot of these congressmen came to the point where they thought, yeah, it's time to cash in. It's time to take that implicit bribe. Because as soon as we retire, we're going to get several million dollars apiece, and that's the payday we're really looking forward to. And now look, what's <laughs> uh, good about my analysis is, right or wrong, we'll be able to see. Okay, So it's out there for you guys. Now, once these guys retire and they get an opportunity, will they take huge money from these uh, lobbying groups? Dorgan, Dodd, Bai, as examples, we'll see. My guess is absolutely Young Turks. I'm sorry, Miss Jackson. Ooh, I am for real. Never meant to make Back on TYT, uh, Jenga Anna with you, uh, but also J.R. Jackson with you. And speaking of which, uh, I think we're going to find out who's more down with J.R. Uh, we can find out. I mean, it's getting kind of lopsided, Uger. I'm a little disappointed in you. Mm, yeah, lately I have not been very down. Uh, I, I got to get back in, in the groove. Well, you need How Uger got his groove back is what's happening right now. Yeah, write the book on that. We'll see. I mean, what, what is it? I mean, we, have, we, we, had, we were very spotty in playing it. Basically, black pop culture, but Anna's been going on a streak. Last two times, definitely she won. It may have been last three. I don't know. You tell me, Anna. Definitely the last three. Yeah. Uh, but he, pre he pretends like he doesn't remember. Right, right, right. I don't believe that for a second. And besides, you have to understand, her overwhelming wi victories are like one nothing. <laughs> okay. It's like soccer in this game. Uh, you get a one nothing lead, and you're cruising. All right. I, so. feel, I feel like I have an easy one for you guys. Okay. Let's we, see how we, we do we, that. We might have, like, you know, it's three questions. Might have three way three pluses on this one. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt <clears> it. Uh, let's start with question number one. Which R&B pop singer is the official face of the limited edition Fashion for Haiti t-shirt? Is it Beyonce, Usher, Rihanna, or Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas? The official face of the limited edition Fashion for Haiti t-shirt. They're modeling it. They're showing it off. Give me the choices one last time. We have Beyonce, Usher, Rihanna, and Will I Am. I got it. Okay. All right. Number two, which pro athlete's former girl on the side had a video surface of her showing off his house, which pissed off his current significant other? Mm. Mm. Um, actually, there's a video of it, too, so we'll do that after you guys figure it out. Uh, is it Tony Park and Eva Longoria, that couple? Lamar Odom and Khloe Kardashian? Is it Grant Hill and Tamia? Or is it Reggie Bush and Kim Kardashian? Again, those the choices again. are uh, the, this pro athlete's former girl on the side. Trick he was dating before. Mm -hmm. Had a video service of her showing off his house, which pissed off his current girl now. And this current girl, these are the current girls with him. Tony Park and Eva Longoria, Lamar Odom and Khloe Kardashian, Grant Hill and Tamia, or Reggie Bush and Kim Kardashian? All right, I have an answer. And my answer is locked in. I'm ready for uh, 
Question number three. Are you ready, Anna? Mm-hmm. Okay. Which black actress isn't offended by John Mayer's offensive comments and the fact that her husband is just as approving? Mm, you guys should know this one. Uh, yeah, you don't even have to read you it. You guys should know this oh one. Oh, my gosh. She's already writing it down. See, that's okay, what I'm saying. I'm in a one nothing hole. These, the, these, these should not be guesses. These should be things you know. All right. Go ahead. Uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it Jada Pinkett Smith, Holly Robinson Pete, Janet Jackson, or Halle Berry? They're not offended by John Mayer's comments and, you know, set off this firestorm. And even said their husband is like, hey, I like it, too. He's a good guy. All right. I have an answer. <laughs> I have an answer. All right. I'm a little hopeful on this one, and if I don't do well, given that he said it's easy, uh, I'm going to be profoundly dis disappointed. So we're going to find out who's down with J.R. Jackson right now. All right, question number one. Who's the official face uh, uh, on, on the Haiti logo, or mm -hmm. whatever they call it, the T-shirts and fashion and apparel and all that stuff? All right, uh, you want me to go first? Sure, go ahead. Will I am? I think you're right. I, I put Rihanna, but I was uh, between those two. Oh, so you put, you think I'm right, but you she does this every time. No, 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 so but I really So you put do, Rihanna. I, but you are right. Okay, then why didn't you put down Will I Am? No, 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 because I thought it was Will I Am, but then I was like, I have a gut feeling it's Rihanna. But then when you said Will I Am, I'm like, oh, I should have worn Will I Am. But who is it? All right, let's see what happens. Uh, no score yet. Oh! Uh, well, yes, winner. <laughs> Beyonce, what's he doing? I mean, what's she doing out there? <laughs> That's well, weird. They want a cute face, man. I guess. Uh, Rihanna has a cute face. I figured you got with those. I figured you guys would try and go with those island folks like Rihanna. Will I am. Yeah. Well, that makes all the sense. Actually, in the I world. know Will I am is even from. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up with Wyclef. But um, yeah. Well, I figured you guys would go. You guys are so predictable. Okay. By the way, I totally got Will I am and Wyclef mixed up. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we both deserve to be at zero, less than zero. Okay. Let's move forward. All right, what was the second question? Oh, the, the celebrity couple and yeah. then uh, the ex coming in with uh, the video of the house. Yeah, it was an older video. It finally popped out and then all that went down. Okay. So uh, I went with simple logic here, and I went with my gut and my first instinct. Uh, I always lose when I get cutesy. Uh, my first instinct was I'd have heard about it if it was Reggie Bush or Kim Kardashian uh, or if it was uh, Eva Longoria and Tony Parker. I'd be really surprised if I didn't hear about it. And then the other power couple was uh, Lamar Odom and, and, and Khloe Kardashian. I mean, who wouldn't hear about that? That's crazy. They'd run screaming to the press, I figured. So I, even though Grant Hill doesn't seem like a player, you know what I'm saying? I'm going with Grant Hill and Tamea. And why are they on the list? Unless he's throwing us a curveball, but that's entirely possible. I'm going to go with Khloe and Lamar. Oh, too wrong again. By the girl's yeah. name, the girl's name is Carmen Ortega, and she was with Reggie Bush in the past. When Kim and he, mm. when, oh, and when he and Kim had their little break at one point, you guys remember that? Oh, he was dating her during yeah. that break. So he was dating. But that her, break but was it, like 13 minutes long. Exactly, which is why <laughs> Kim is a little pissy about this. Now let's let's see a little bit of the video she put up. She's showing I'm off that she knows Reggie. I'm at my friend Reggie's house. Take a look, a look around. This is the game room. Oh, playing. God, um, she's so skanky. It's awesome. What is it called? I forgot what this is called. I don't even know. I forgot what this okay, is called. let's go in here. I guess somebody was a little wrestler one day. Look at this beautiful house. Let's go downstairs. Look at somebody with a friend. Crazy, crazy. Crazy boys. Look at the view. <laughs> ah, this is nuts, man. I mean, she's, this is such a trophy video for her. This is Beverly Hills, baby. <laughs> and actually, it's the hills. The hills. This is a beautiful view. It's not just good enough to take a picture anymore with Reggie. This Bush. is living it up, living a life. Nice hot tub memories. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's so oh, good. Let's see if my car's there. Ferrari. And that could not have been more of a hoe tour. <laughs> okay. She was uh, hosting like MTV's Cribs. Yeah. And she's like, look, uh, I'm so, like, the minute, I mean, that's why these celebrities, man, it's tough. I mean, on the one hand, you get girls like that anytime you want. On the other hand, 
the minute you leave them alone for a second, they're like, oh my god, I'm in his house. Let's take some videos. Let's put it on the internet. That's awesome. Look, look, look. It's me and Reggie Bush's house. Yeah. Hot tub memories. Yeah. And then she does it in her bikini top for no reason. <laughs> awesome. So and she she responded. I, I but I'm going to blame Anna for me getting this wrong. Why? How is that not on the show? I don't know. I didn't see that story anywhere. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, no, she, she was getting all that flack, you know, like, oh, look at this hoe. You're just a chick on the side, la, la, la. And so she had a little response. I'll read a little bit of it. She put it for one of these sites in response. Earlier this week, a video surfaced on the web showing me on a private tour of New Orleans Saints player Reggie Bush's home. The published blog posts about the video have painted me as everything from a thirsty hoe to a jump off. <laughs> to a jump off? <laughs> yeah, jump off is another term for the chick on the side. The chick <laughs> The chick you're cheating, with, uh, cheating on your woman with. Mm -hmm. uh, these names aren't insulting. They're just not true. As you all know, Reggie and I have, have had a brief, short-lived relationship almost one year ago. During that time, we both were in serious relationships with other people, but we had an understanding. Quotes. And then, la, 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 and she's upset that Kim Kardashian's mad then, and it was wait a before the Super Bowl. La, la, la. But I don't get it. Didn't, didn't she just admit she was a jump off? That they were both in serious relationship but had an understanding? That sounds like, jump off. I hadn't heard that term before. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, so far, by the way, we could not be less down. I know. Okay. I'm hoping the third answer rescues us a little bit, but then it seemed you were so cocksure on it that I seem like I'm at least in a, in a hole here in terms of who's more sure about their answer. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's remind people at home who's, who are playing along with the question and, and possible answers. With. The last one was, which one of these black actresses is not offended by John Mayer's offensive comments? And in fact, her husband is just as happy as she is. Uh, I'm going with Holly Robinson Pete because he mentioned her in the interview and said uh, something about Holly Robinson Pete. And, and hence, uh, she, her husband would also have to not be offended, et cetera, uh, because, you know, he talked about having sex with her. So that's why, I mean, I've got a very educated guess on this one that's not helped me in the past. <laughs> so let's, let's find out. All Anna. right. Well, we're tied because that was uh, my answer, and I know it's right. She knows it's right because it's right. Mm. All right, oh, there you have it. Oh, no, I'm levitating, a very excited Pete said. There's nothing that makes a 45-year-old mother four feel better than when she's dropping her kids off at school to get a link on my iPhone that says, John Mayer thinks I'm hot. Anyway, and on and on. But I don't know if you guys are going to cover this today. She's actually taking it back, and she's mad at him now. Oh, Why? she is? Why? Because no, no, she said no, first know. she just got like an e or email or a message from a friend saying, oh, there was an interview, and John Mayer says he thinks you're hot. And she says, I don't know who's happier, me or my husband. John Mayer is a part of the soundtrack of our everyday lives. We always have music playing in the house, and it's usually dad's mixes with Mayer songs. Ugh. And then I follow John on Twitter because I think he's so damn funny. He's got a giant brain, and he uses it. Mm. He's unpredictable. Oh, really? and <laughs> yeah, unfortunate. <laughs> he's unpredictable and funny. Some people may not like that, but I find him extremely refreshing and amusing. That was originally. Now what happened? She's turned it around now? Oh, yeah, because for that, all those comments I just read, she caught a lot of heat, and they said, did you know what he said and then she said oh, I didn't get the full context she got the full context and now he actually specifically like called and apologized to her apologizing that she ended up in his quote but not apologizing for what he was saying so she's like you know he needs to grow up and figure his shit out and all this so she's still upset all right so he used the n-word we covered that story before in the next segment we're going to cover what he said about uh, gay folks and what he wants to do with them uh -oh. okay now uh, to finish this up, you've got to have a tiebreaker. I have now. a tiebreaker, and I don't know. If you guys don't get this one, then I have something else. Maybe we'll cut it down lower. But there's a, this chick was at a, the first annual Date Awards in Hollywood back at the, in, in, near the end of January, and she was wearing a ridiculous outfit. Who is this celebrity? Oh, uh, God, I'm such a winner. I could give you guys these seven choices I have, but if you have it, that'd be even better. Do you know? Can you tell? I All have. right, so are you going to risk writing it down right now? <clears throat> Yes. Okay, she's writing it down. She will get extra credit if she's right. Now, I'll take the list of seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so check out one more time. Lovely outfit. Okay, it's hard to see from our screen here. But well, I, okay. I blurred out her face, obviously. Right. Um, is it Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Alicia Keys, Rihanna, Beyonce, Khalees, or Tony Braxton? Those are your seven choices. Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Alicia Keys, Rihanna, Beyonce, Khalees, or Tony Braxton? Do you know? Do you know? 
There's a lot of choice. You guys may both get it wrong, so I have something that might be a little tighter to get it, to handle this. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know. I had two possibilities. You know how that goes. I'm almost never right. Uh, but I'm ready. Okay. I'm going to go with a wild card here. I'm going with Tony Braxton. Mm. That's a hell of a wild card to play in this case. I would just like to announce that Anna Kasparian is going to win another Who's Down with J.R. Jackson <laughs> because it's Khalees. Let's see the close-up. Well, either one. Oh, yeah. Who's the boss? That is Khalees with spikes <laughs> in her hair. <laughs> that is definitely not Tony Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And she has a big gray mane going down her back. It's, it's, it's amazing how crazy she looks there. And look at her heels. Okay. I don't, why would Tony Braxton wear heels like that? That was such a terrible answer. <laughs> it's over. And uh, for at least the third time in a row. I am disastrously <laughs> knocked down, apparently, and uh, Anna is the winner. Okay, I look. I, I know when to concede. I know what reality is. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Anna. Thank you. So, Anna, could you could you recognize her, or did you know about this horrible outfit? I just follow, you know, black pop culture stories. So, you know, that's what people like me do. Do you have a hood pass? I do. I have a hood pass. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to think so. I I know. I knew two of those uh, questions. Two out of four. I don't know if that gets you a hood pass. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, before we uh, pull a John Mayer here, we're going to end this segment. Um, all right, but we're going to come back with more outrageous comments from John Mayer, Young Turks. Sign up for membership on theyoungturks.com and get the whole three-hour show plus an uncensored postgame.